But on to more important stuff, we have been studying the uh, the Word of God and how the the Bible has come to where it is at, and we've been going uh, been using a book to help with that study, and it's a book written by Randall Price called "Searching for the Original Bible." Is a who wrote it and why? Is it reliable? And has the text changed over time? And as we've discussed in the past, why why should we study something like this? As Christians, it is our duty to be able to answer for things and to be able to, to have actual facts of why we believe what we believe. People can believe anything. I can believe I can run through this wall. Doesn't make it true, does it? <laughs> so should we not base our what we believe on facts? Instead of it being I believe, it's I know. When you, words matter. So when you say, I know, what does that mean? You're sure. You're sure. You have facts to substantiate why you know. I say, I can believe I can run through this wall. I can't give you the reasons and the facts that I can prove to you that I know I can run through this wall. But there's a difference. So I believe, in my, in my humble opinion, I believe we shouldn't be saying, I believe. When we know something, let's say, I know. Here are the reasons why I know. To back that up. So before we begin, let's bow in a word of prayer, and I'll uh, I'll lead us in that. Dear Heavenly Father, hallowed be Thy wonderful, loving, matchless name. We come to you once again, as your sons and daughters, to study your Word, to grow in your Word, and to apply it in our daily lives. We thank you for everything you've blessed us with. We ask that we strive to study your Word thoroughly and understand it. In Jesus' name, amen. So we're going to kind of do a little, little bit of backpedaling uh, to kind of refresh, and we won't go back too far, but where we're going to start is um, the witness to the original Old Testament. And we kind of got into this last week, but if we look at the original text of the Hebrew Bible, is witnessed by two, two different things, both the primary and secondary sources. And it should be a natural, natural, honest question of if the original Bible is not no longer here and has vanished and or it has been destroyed, what remains in the present day to testify to? It? Should be a valid question. And I say there are two different categories, a primary and a secondary. The first category we will be looking at are the copies of the ancient Hebrew manuscripts. Second, second category are the versions of ancient transit or translations into other uh, languages. Third category is paraphrases of the Hebrew texts. And the fourth category are quotations of Hebrew texts. So when we look at it, we have quite a few different breakdowns. As far as the Hebrew manuscripts, we have throughout the, uh, throughout the years, as far as uh, discoveries and uh, archaeology, we've got the silver amulet, the, the Nash papyrus or papyrus, the Dead Sea Scrolls. We have out of those, we have the Psalms 36, 36 manuscripts, Deuteronomy 29, Isaiah 21. We have the Habakkuk commentaries, the Tiflin and Mezuzus, from the Judean desert. The Severus scrolls are the R. Meyer Torah. We have in addition, approximately 3,000 3, Masoretic text manuscripts. And from our past, and we'll actually, we'll, we'll get into it again, what, what it is to be, or what is meant by the Masoretic text, how we got those. Secondary witnesses, we have the Septuagint, and these are covered as basically versions or translations of the Hebrew Bible. Aquila, the Symmachus, the Ebonite. And pronunciations on these are going to be fun. You can make up your own. <laughs> the Cage Theodician or Theodosian, Erigens Hexapla, Hescaeus, Has Lucian, Post, Hecapur. Hecapleric revisions. 
Samaritan Pentateuch, or Pentateuch, Greek versions and or recessions, the Aramaic Tergums, the Syriac versions, and there are two different versions. There's the Peshitta and the Syro Hexapla, or Hex Hexapla. We have the Latin versions. We have two different of those. We have Old Latin and the Latin Vulgate. Coptic versions such as the Syriac, the Achimic, Gemimic and Boric, Ethiopic versions, Armenian versions, and Arabic versions. I just want everybody to notice the, the uh, very first item in that list, the Samaritan Pentateuch. So I'm just mentioning it in my lesson this morning. So just keep in mind that that's on, on the list of secondary witnesses. And we will, and I think this, we will be able to get into, into that in this, this lesson. We'll go into a brief history of that. As I said, unfortunately, history-wise, I, I, I know it, it can be dry and dull sometimes, but you have to try to learn to fight through it because it is important stuff. One of my questions is, are most of these documents in some library or some place where they're there are some, yes. And a lot of them, so there's usually what you find is that there are going to be a couple different ways that they are preserved and or stored right now. One is, as I say, national libraries, museums, stuff like that. Other are actually private collections. That's where you'll learn that you'll find some of these that that's where they were found or some were found in markets. Just kind of somebody had them and didn't realize what they had and sold. And so somebody buys them as a private collector and sometimes they will donate them to libraries for loan or museums for loan, but some they actually keep as a private private collector. I was just gonna say that, you know, it's also compounded by the fact that you have copies of, of these as well. Copies so of copies. Copies of the originals, you have copies of the, of the uh, copies, I guess you would say, and by comparing them all, you, can, you know, that becomes a witness to the authenticity of the copies. Right. And that's the process of that is called textual criticism. If you have, let's say, a thousand different versions of something, you should be able to create a standard to look at something and go back to find out what the closest was to the original based off of all those different versions. So the Maseratic text. Although our modern Old Testaments are translated from 10th century Masoretic texts, most translations also take into account the witness of the ancient versions or translations. And since the Masoretic text is also, is also a witness to the original, although not, it's usually used with that and other Hebrew texts to compare textual criticisms, we are going to start with it because it is actually one of the ones that is used the most. This is the, the text that is used the most to generate most of our, or actually 90, probably, I think probably around, I think percent wise, if I remember right, is around somewhere around 90% or a majority of our Old Testament translations come from. So it is, it is a traditional text for a present Hebrew Bible in which all of our English transition or translations of the Old Testament come from, right? The ancient Hebrew manuscripts are called the Masor, or Masora. It, had its final fixed form in the 10th century AD, so around 901 AD to 1000 AD. And it represents a group of ancient Hebrew manuscripts. As I said, there was this Masorah. The name Masoretic comes derived from the scribal school called the Masorites. All right. And it is based off hundreds of lost medieval manuscripts. The Masoretic school. Their primary activity between the uh, 500 AD to about 1000 AD was to copy, edit, and preserve textual trans or traditions passed down to them. And not in this one, but I was reading a commentary on the schools. And one of the one of the things that, that keeps getting brought up by skeptics is, hey. The, the, what is it, Lost in, Tra or there's a movie, what, Lost in Translation? So if you take a copy and a copy and a copy, they're worried about, well, does something get left out? Does this, does that? Is that possible? 
Yeah, human error. We're humans. But these schools, or the, specifically the Maserati school, that they took this to a, a, a degree of, try to compare. How many have ever seen the, the, the soldiers that guard the tomb of the unknown soldier? Very elite group of men and women that are assigned to guard the, the, or the, uh, the tomb of the unknown soldier. Their task, and this is a specific school that they get hand selected to. You have to apply, you get picked. And even once these are very highly decorated military personnel, that they take the best of the best of the best and they select them for this. And they then, on top of that, go through hundreds of hours of training. They get scrutinized every day, every morning, just to guard that tomb. They take it to the extreme, down to the very minute detail. If something's not right, you don't go out and perform that day. That is comparison to what this school was for as far as how they treated copying a text. You did not mess up. They wanted to make sure everything was to the letter. To the point that they had, and I think we covered it last week, just like in our Bibles, how we have notations of something when you look, you see a little asterisk or a little number that says, you know, look off to the side for this to tell you what, what is there. Either, hey, in this version, this, this letter, or this word was used and or it was to be read as. That is what they did. They wanted to make sure that everything was copied over. And if there was anything that needed to be added or changed, they put a notation so that you as a reader could see, hey, in this version, there was this, 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 or this, or it was meant to be read as this. But they did not want to change the original text. That is how accurate and how seriously they took their job. And we see it, there was two, uh, two scribal schools were involved in this production under the Maserati text. There was an Eastern or the Babylonian school and the Western Palestine, or the Western school, Palestine. The Palestinian school had two different branches of their own, families of Aaron ben Moses ben Ashur and the family of uh, ben Naphtilian in, in Tiberias. And even though the two families upheld two separate textual traditions based off region, just like we here in Washington state kind of talk a little bit different if you go down to Alabama, right? Two, ge or two geographical areas, kind of same English or same, same structure of English, but you can definitely tell that there's a difference, right? Same thing. Two different schools, same language, but they had two uh, textual traditions. And out of those two, there was eight small differences in the contextual text. Only eight small differences between the two of them. The first complete Hebrew Bible was produced in 1925 by Ben Ashur and is known as the Aleppo Codex. And it today is actually being held in the Hebrew University, kind of what you're asking, where are these, where are these kept? The Maserati text being accepted as an authorized text is a starting point for our textual critics in their attempt to reconstruct, reconstruct the original text and the standard text to which all other ancient Hebrew manuscripts are compared. Even though the Masoretic text was not only the only text circulating in Egypt Judaism, when compared with other witnesses, it is usually recognized to be the closest to the original. So based off of all the other texts out there, it is usually considered to be the closest. The most important surviving manuscripts of the Masoretic text all came from the Ben Ashur family. We see, as I say, out of the, the main ones is the Codex Carinus, and that was in 89 AD or 895 AD, the Aleppo Codex in between 925 to 930 AD, the Oriental 44 or 4445. That was in 950 AD, and then there was uh, something redone in 1540. Codex Leningradinus, uh, or known as Leningrad B19A, 
That was in between 1008 and 1009 AD. And then the Leningrad Petersburg Codex of the Prophets in 916 AD. And out of these, we see Codex, the Codex Carinus only contains the former and latter prophets. The Aleppo Codex, once as a complete copy, or once was a complete copy, but due to natural causes of a fire, about one fourth of it was destroyed. So we only have a small piece of it. Let me get down to further notes here. The Oriental 440 or 4445, out of that codex, it is the one that contains most of the Pentateuch, or Pentateuch and that's Genesis 3, or 3920 through Deuteronomy 133. We see Codex Leningradinus is a complete text of the Old Testament that served as a source for the most of the current critical editions of the Hebrew text. And the Leningrad Codex of the Prophets actually only contained the latter prophets. We also have the Damascus Pentateuch, and that was in the late 9th to 10th century AD. Codex, oh wow, Reclinius of the Prophets, 1005 AD, and Erfrutinus Codex, 1000 to 1300 AD. Now we get to the Nash Papyrus. The Nash Papyrus was the earliest example of the Hebrew text written on any papyrus type of material. It is actually found, was found in 1902 by W.L. Nash. He, is a, he was actually the secretary for the Society of Biblical Archaeology in England. And he acquired this papyrus fragment from an Egyptian dealer and subsequently donated it to the Cambridge University Library. It's paleographic date. And for those that don't know how paleographic is determined, is it's determined by the style of the script. So it's how it's structured and the writing, writing text. Is it determined to be written in the Hesmonian period, which would be between 169 to 37 BC? although some have dated it closer to 70 AD as far as closer to being towards the second temple period. It is made up of a combination of biblical passages from Exodus 20, the 10 commandments, all the way through Deuteronomy six. An interesting note is on this, on the Nash Papyrus, is that the passage begins, the, or it's, actual passage or the first word in it begins with the word supported only by the Septuagint version of the Bible. So it is only supported by the Greek version. Even in the small sample, it can be seen that scribal variations occurred or the Nash papyrus reflects an earlier copy that contained different variations. Portions of this collection was used for devotional purposes. Now we move on to one of our biggest, probably witnesses, more recent years, the Dead Sea Scrolls. Everybody should know about those, right? A lot of interesting history behind the Dead Sea Scrolls. So I think the actual excavation, if I remember right, if correct me if I'm wrong, Carl, started around, was it 1946 to 47? I think late 46, late 47 but wasn't actually revealed to everybody until around 1948. They were discovered in jars or buried in the floors of caves lining the cliffs along the western shores of the Dead Sea in Israel. And they were found in 11, in 11 different caves in chronological order. These documents were produced by Jewish scribes, and they are the oldest copies of the Hebrew Bible that we have known right now. The text is written in columns and written in the language of Hebrew, Aramaic, and in Greek. And they were either, usually written on leather parchment and are papyrus. Now, the number of biblical manuscripts is approximately around 230, including 
in whole or fragmentary form every book of the Hebrew Bible except for the book of Esther. Pretty amazing. All but one. All right. The biblical text in the forms of such as the Targumus, the Aramaic free translation of the Bible, the Teflon, and the Mesolithic biblical passages of Exodus and Deuteronomy. And there is some, que or not question, but there is some debate as far as how many actual manuscripts. And I'll show you here in a second. So we see in how the or chronological, chronological order of how these went. Genesis, there was 24 scrolls. Exodus, we find 18 scrolls. Leviticus, 18 scrolls. Numbers, 11. Deuteronomy, 33. Joshua, 2. Judges, 3. First and second Samuel, there's four. First and second Kings, three. Isaiah, 22. Jeremiah, six. Ezekiel, six. The 12 minor prophets, there was 10. Writings, the Psalms, the 39 of them. Proverbs, 2. Job, 6. What are known as the five scrolls, there were four. Songs of Songs, 4. Ruth, 4. Laminations, 3. Ecclesiastics, which is funny, is he references as zero scrolls. And I haven't quite got to the bottom of that, and I will. Esther, 8. Daniel, there was one. Ezra through Nehemiah and First and Second Chronicles one. In in the book here, he references it as I think close to when you calculate uh, some factors in that the total has been adjusted down to two hundred twenty three. And due to this, there are six scrolls from the Qumran uh, cave, which I'll show you guys in reference of that contains portions of two books counted twice. And one scroll from another cave known as the Wadi Murabata contains portions of three books counted three times. And so when you factor those in, it, or factor that count in, it goes down from 231 to about 223. It's believed to be composed between 152 BC to 68 AD. And based off of uh, paleographic analysis, dating by the style of the manuscripts, the carbon dating of carbon-14 testing of the scrolls, the outer wrappings and the materials that they're wrapped in and associated with uh, what is known as datable material, such as when they open up a cave, if they find a coin in there that has got a date on it and or other items that can be dated. Based off of those, that evidence, they believe a safe estimate would be between 225 BC to 68 AD. But I have also seen scholars state that they also believe that there could be a little bit of a later and earlier date. Um, I think they say anywhere between 352 BC is on some of the caves that they've found materials that they've dated and all the way up to, I wanna say uh, 136 AD. So still falls within that range. Oops, let me make sure. The Dead Sea Scrolls are the most significant single contribution of the scrolls has been their witness to the earliest known text of our Hebrew Bible. Part of the text in the Dead Sea Scrolls is within a couple of generations to the original text. In Cave 1, a copy of the entire book of Isaiah dated at around 125 BC was located. And this scroll itself is a multi-generational copy. That means it's been copied more than once throughout the generation. And it is proved to be identical to the Masoretic text of Isaiah in over 95% of its text. So when they take this, the book of Isaiah, the scroll that they found and is dated to 125 BC, and they compare it to what the Masoretic text of Isaiah shows, 95% accuracy in the translation of word to word. A 5% variation consistent. And they, when they examined it, that 5% usually consisted of obvious slips of the pen and or spelling alterations. So a difference in spelling. And one of the interesting uh, things I was, when I was doing some research is looking up through 
and a lot of it boils down to I don't remember in which in which book it was, but when they when you look at the word David, it was spelled in what they call proto um, proto Maseratic text. So proto, everybody knows what prototype is, or what, what the word or the pronoun the proto means beforehand. So before there was a or before Maseratic text, they had something similar. And that's where it was derived from. And so when they looked at that language, the spelling of David was DVD. After, I believe it was after the post-exile and closer past, over the 700 years, the language changed. Uh, it was changing and it changed from spelling of David from DVD to DVYD. And so that is where you see a lot of the spelling alterations is what they're contributing that to. <clears throat> so we see a 95% of the text as being accurate. What is other interesting is the, re the remaining biblical scrolls that were found in the caves, 60% of all the texts of these biblical texts reflect the same text that is found in the Masoretic text. And when you actually go back and you start looking at the, the pre-Masoretic or the proto-Masoretic, we see that there is actually a greater percentage rate. Understanding of the original composition of Hebrew text is also eliminated by compar comparison when you, when you take both the biblical and non-biblical texts of the Dead Sea Scrolls compared to the Masoretic text. And when they do that, they see that there is an 80% of the time when you compare the Masoretic text with the Dead Sea Scrolls, you get, you get 80% accuracy. The out of the remaining 20% that doesn't match up, 5% matches up to the Septuagint Bible or the Septuagint version. The other 5% matches up to the S Samaritan Pentateuch. And that, so that only leaves a 10% difference, which could be contributed to, like we were discussing, well, how Washington State talks, how Alabama talks. Difference is usually contributed due to the geographical difference in local text types, Egyptian compared to Babylonian compared to Palestinian. So when you boil it down, all of these minute discrepancies that people talk about and use to discredit the Bible can actually be explained logically. So as we we're talking about, you have the Qumran cave, the Wadi Murabata, and we're gonna also cover some of the caves found down here in Masada. These are all along the Dead Sea. So just south of where the Dead Sea Scrolls were located, but still along the Western shores, other scrolls were, were discovered between 1950 and 1960. The last one was actually discovered in 2005. These texts are often handled differently from the Dead Sea Scroll because they come from different time periods. So therefore created by a group of Jews distinct from the sect that produced the Dead Sea Scrolls. But they do give insight into that time frame and how to look at the text. The earliest discoveries were made in the caves of Wadi Murabaat, where a number of biblical texts had been deposited during the time of the Bar Kahaba revolt, which was between 132 and 135 AD. During this revolt, was a, it was the last of the three major Jewish Roman wars. And these included, in these, uh, in these caves, there included fragmentary texts from the Torah. Remember, Torah's Genesis, Exodus, Numbers, and Deuteronomies. And then there was a copy of the latter prophets, which contained 10 out of the 12 minor prophets. These texts had an almost complete resemblance with the Maseratic texts, with only three meaningful variations in the texts of the latter prophets. So once again, we have older documents that are matching up almost completely, except for three minor variations. We also see um, from the Nal, Nal Salim and the Nal Hever caves. So just below, I believe it's right below the Nal Hever is the Nal, the Nal Salim. Came two philosophy texts. You remember philosophy? We covered this last week. 
So you remember with the with the Jews, with the scroll that had been used so many times, they had a special place called the Ginzia or the Ginza that they stuck that at because you could not burn the word of God. We learned about how Greeks had, well, what do you do with a piece of, a piece of paper and you wanted to write something new? And you read over it. That is called a, a, fla a flacitory. So in the Nahal Salim cave, there came two flacitory texts from Exodus 13, 12, or 13, verses 2 through 16. And in these, there were two small square leather boxes containing slips inscribed with scriptural passages that were traditionally worn on the, whoops, I may be wrong here. I, I stand corrected, folks. Wrong terminology. A flacitory. Now I remember. I told you I was going to have one of those moments. A flacitory, actually, inside the, inside the cage, there's two small box or two small square leather boxes, and they contain slips. These are flacitories. They were inscribed with scriptural passages and traditionally were worn on the left arm and or the head by observant Jewish men during their, during their uh, temple worships and synagogues. And so on those two texts they found, or on those two slips, they found Exodus 13, two through 60 on there. I told you I was gonna have one of those. From 1963 through 65, excavations were also conducted at Masada. Masada was a mountain fortress of Herod the Great and was destroyed during the Roman siege in 73 AD. And inside the remains of this, the synagogue at the site were discovered the Genzias, remember? The pile of uh, discarded old sc uh, sc or scrolls. And from that came 14 scrolls, which included fragments uh, covering Genesis, Leviticus, Deuteronomy, Psalms, Ezekiel. It also had certain uh, Sec or what is known as secretarian writings. Businesses are basically, it would be the transcribing of uh, 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 kind of like our, our court proceedings and or at a judicial hearing or the government, anything that they were documenting. And it also had certain parts of the apocrypha. Now, now we move on to secondary witnesses. And this is where I think Carl is going to have some of his in his lesson, the Septuagint. Septuagint is actually the Latin word for 70. It is the most important of the versions due to it being used by the authors of the New Testament. And most of their quotations of Old Testament, of the Old Testament are from this source and served as the early churches as an authoritative biblical text. Jewish writers out, or outside sources, such as uh, Flavius Josephus and Philo, actually use the Septuagint as a resource in their writings. In a letter called the Letter of Aristeus, it records a highly stylized and legendary account of how it was produced, the Septuagint. And in this document or in this letter, it states that uh, Ptolemy II of Egypt, who was a king at the time, asked the high priest Eliezer for, to take six elders from each of the 12 tribes to make a translation into Greek of the Hebrew Bible for the library at Alexandria. Even though the letter claims it was translated uniformly by equally skilled translator with an accuracy that implied inerrancy, we see by historical facts, though, it does show otherwise. It was done by many different hands whose skills and even philosophy of translating varied considerably. Okay. Even though the word or the Latin word is 70, it would have actually been 72 hands, six times 12, 72. The Pentateuch was the first translated in the third century BC and is referred to as Old Greek text. The only church father on record to ever point this out was Jerome. And we see that the rest of the Old Testament was completed over the next few centuries. So what is the value of the Septuagint towards the Hebrew Bible? Well, the value of the Septuagint is that it is a witness 
to the pre-Maseratic text. It points to an earlier version of Maseratic language that is different from the Maseratic text itself. However, in, comp in comparison with the Maseratic text, Maseratic text does appear intrinsically more reliable than the Septuagint as far as the two, two different versions, okay? Except in some cases where it preserves a reading that is to be preferred when it is in agreement with a Hebrew manuscript, such as the biblical manuscripts of the Dead Sea Scroll. We see that sometimes in that translation, it was more accurate as far as the trans or as far as the what is to be read or what is translated compared to the Maseratic text. Some of the most important out of the, the Septuagint is what we see is the Chester Beatty Papyri between second and fourth century AD, the Oxcrunius Papyri first through ninth century AD, the Rylands Papyri, and that was between second century BC through fifth century BC or eight, fifth century AD. Uh, but I have seen documents or some scholars have actually said that um, they actually credited to an actual an earlier uh, or an older date of actually between the fourth cent, 14th century BC. We see Codex Vet, Vaticanus, fourth century AD, Codex Sinaiticus, Sinatic, fourth through fifth century AD, Codex Alexandrian, Alexandrinus, fifth century AD, Codex Ephraim, fifth through sixth AD, and then the Amherst Collection, 4th century AD. Interesting note on the Codex Ephremi. This is where I was wrong thinking as far as the, the uh, calling the, or the Felagianus or whatever that was, mixing them up. So the Codex Ephremi. It is a major unical mans manuscript that is a palimpsest. A palimp palimp ah, geez. So a palimpsest is actually what I was describing earlier. That is where a piece of paper in Greek, or back in the Greek times, if they had a, 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 a papyri and they wanted to reuse it, they just scribbled it out like a pencil and then wrote over it, right? So its text was erased in around 12th century and was written over with a sermon. So some preacher out there, could you imagine? Yeah, you, you pick up this piece of paper and you scribble out everything and erase it and then you write over it. Come to find out it originally contained the complete Old Testament. That is what actually happened on this piece of paper. It now only has portions of Proverbs, Songs of Solomon, Job, and part of the Apocrypha. So by a process of, uh, I believe it's UV lighting and some other process that they use, they can actually see what was written below it, and they still have captured that portion of it. Uh, actually, we'll end off right there, at the, and we'll start up with the Samaritan Pentateuch, or Pentateuch next week. Uh, scripture today is from John chapter 4, verses 23 through 24. Get ready for call. The hour is coming and now is when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father is seeking, is seeking out to, or the Father is seeking such. Such, okay, <laughs> to worship him. God is spirit and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. I need to get a more readable text. We don't do cursive in my generation. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Maybe I pick a different guy to do it. <laughs> older generation. Hey, at least he's speaking the truth. <laughs> there you go. And in love. All right, well, welcome everybody. Glad you're all here. It is good to see more and more people being able to get out and, and uh, worship with, all together with us. Mm -hmm. So thankful for that.
And uh, as we get started, as I've been doing for the last while, is uh, having a scripture about love. And this one is Matthew 22, 37, 38. You shall love the Lord with your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. This is going to be associated with the scripture we just, the Bo just read for us, and also uh, we'll see how it fits in to the lesson as we uh, proceed on. We're continuing talking about the person, Jesus. Jesus of Nazareth, we always think of him as being the Son of God or being God, or divine, and able to do miracles and all those things. And, but sometimes we forget that he was a man like you and me. And that's what. Uh, We've been talking about his life kind of with a, with a view towards his humanity. And uh, last week we talked about uh, John the Baptist's testimony concerning, concerning Jesus, where he said, he must increase. Uh, Jesus must increase. And he says, I must decrease. But anyway, Jesus begins increasing. Uh, his ministry is ramping up. And he's uh, been baptizing in the area of uh, the, the southern end of the Jordan River near the Dead Sea. John the Baptist was baptizing in the, in the northern section, but only about 30 miles apart. And that's when John said, uh, I must decrease, he must increase. And then Jesus leaves uh, for Galilee. Uh, we, we ended up with Jesus leaving for Galilee, Galilee, and uh, he's heading up to this beautiful area of, of what we, we know as Israel or Palestine, and uh, he's heading up to the northern place. Uh, remember from last week, uh, when, he, when he learned that the, the Pharisees knew, knew that he was preaching and baptizing more disciples than John, he decided to head up to Galilee. Uh, it was a dangerous situation for him to, to get on the bad side of the, the Pharisees this early in his ministry. And so he, he gets, gets out of Dodge for a while. And, uh, but, it, but it's, we're, we're told, it says, but he needed to go through Samaria. Well, I want to ask you the question, why, why did he need to go to Samaria? What was it about Samaria that he needed to go? Most of the people, most Jewish folks, uh, when they went from southern, or from Judea or the southern Israel up to uh, Galilee, they would take uh, a route. Jesus is starting right here by the Jordan. They would take a route that followed, followed this red line up on the eastern side of the Jordan River simply for the purpose of avoiding going through Samaria. We'll talk more about why they uh, avoided Samaria. Well, we might as well just talk about it now. Samaria was, uh, the, the people of Samaria were people that are comprised of two groups of people, really. When the nation of Israel was taken into captivity in Babylon, 500 years before this, actually almost 600 years before this, uh, there were some people that didn't get taken off into captivity. They left the, for lack of a better term, the, the lower echelon of society. They didn't want them up in Babylon, and so they left them there. And then uh, eventually, 70 years later, they were allowed to come back. But some of the people that were up there in captivity for 70 years, some of them had mixed with and, and married uh, people of other races who were uh, also held in captivity up there. And so they became a mixed race, so to speak, not, not what, what the Jew, the, the purebred, shall we say, Jewish folks uh, considered, uh, well, they looked down their nose at, at what, the term that we wouldn't use today, but they, they would think of them as like half breeds. Uh, anyway, so it got to be so bad that when, when uh, the Samaritans offered to help rebuild the temple when they came back, 
Jewish people that were rebuilding the temple said, no thanks, we don't need your help. Mm -hmm. A great insult to these people. And so bad blood ensued. And even then 500 years later, there was still bad blood between the, the Samaritans and the Jewish people, especially those down in Judea. Mm -hmm. And so they would, they would go out of their way to not have to talk to any Samaritan people so usually that's the case. So but, but Jesus said, that this, somehow it said he needed to go through Samaria. Well, he didn't need to. There's many ways to go. You don't have to go through Samaria to get Galilee. But we're going to see uh, in just a minute that the word for needed means a little bit more deeply, something deeply than than. Uh, what it just says here, but before we get to that, I want to say the route that he did take was following the green line. He went up through mountainous territory to get into in, to get through Samaria. Much more difficult journey as far as actually walking, going up and down mountains and hill, hilly roads and windy roads, and perhaps more dangerous because uh, more places for thieves to hide and that sort of thing. But he he needed to go that way, but. As I said, there, it really means something a little bit more deep than just needed to. The actual Greek word says he was compelled to go through Samaria. Something made him go there. Not that he needed to for some, something compelled him to go through Samaria. The question that we'll answer or try to answer in this lesson is why did he need or why was he compelled to go through Samaria? And to get the answer for that, we're going to look at the story of the woman at the well. Very familiar story to, to everyone. So we're not going to learn many new details, but hopefully we'll get, get some uh, good things out of it as we, as we go through it. It's in John chapter 4, and we're going to start reading in verse 5. And so it says, so when he came to a city of Samaria... And keep in mind, Samaria was, for lack of a better term, a state. It was part of a part of the nation of Israel. Uh, just like you have Arizona and you have that doesn't work. You have New York, the state of New York, then you have the city of New York. So you have New York City. When you say I'm going to New York, where do, where do you usually think you're going? You're going to the city, but not necessarily. If I say I'm going to New York, I might be going to Albany. And so the same thing was true with Samaria. There was a, the area of Samaria, and then there was the, the city of Samaria. So he's, he's not going to the city of Samaria. It says he came to a city of Samaria. So he's going uh, to another place besides the city of Samaria. And he's going to this place, which is called Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jacob gave to his son, Joseph. Now, Jacob's well was there. And Jesus, therefore, being wearied from his journey, sat thus by the well, and it was about the sixth hour. So here's Jesus. Remember, he's got some, some of his disciples with him already. He's got four, four of the ones that are going to be apostles one day. Anyway, he's got disciples with him, and, that, and they're going up. But he's sitting by a well, apparently by himself. As we'll see uh, in a little while, he, he was by himself, sitting there at the well. It says that he was wearied. From his journey. This kind of shows his humanness a bit. He got tired, just like you and I do. He, he, had, he had walked uh, 30 miles or so, 25, 20 miles. Uh, you know, if you walk that far, you're going to be tired. And he was sitting there and being weary. And it was about the sixth hour, which in, in the Jewish time, the sixth hour was noon. What do you usually do at noon? <laughs> you eat something. And so he was not just tired, but he was also hungry. We're going to learn in, in a little bit that his disciples were off into the city to get food. So he, he's uh, tired, he's hungry, and we're going to see that he's uh, thirsty as well as we go through this story. So uh, he's a human being, just like the rest of us. And it says that in verse 7 that a woman of Samaria came to draw water. And Jesus said to her, give me a drink. 
for his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. Then the woman of Samaria said to him, how is it that you, being a Jew, ask a drink from me, a Samaritan woman? And so you see a hint of this bad blood already <clears throat> as we look in here. The woman is surprised. You're a, you're a Jewish fellow. How could, what are you talking to me, a, a Samaritan and a Samaritan woman at that? Well, right now, people out there in the cancel culture land would be saying, hold on here. This needs to get taken out of the Bible right here because the Jews were obviously racist. They didn't want to have anything to do with the Samaritans. And so we need to we need to get a pair of scissors, don't we? Get a pair of scissors and cut that out of the Bible because you can't have racism in the Bible. I can't have racism at all. And so we got to get that out of here. And so when you do that, here's what it's going to look like because the entire Bible history has accounts of racism and who knows all kinds of things that would not be uh, approved by the counter uh, the cancel culture and so I just want to take this little side note because you're going to be hearing stuff I mean if they're going to cancel cancel a popular few and and uh, all, Dr. Seuss and uh, it'll it'll be it'll be uh, Roadrunner and uh, Wiley Coyote. You know, you can't be dropping animals on top of people. You know, how about fever? Every everything is going to get canceled pretty soon. Then they'll have to cancel, cancel. <laughs> but anyway, that's kind of a side note where we are. But the Jews were in fact racist but then so were the samaritans they didn't like each other and so she this woman says what are you doing talking to me a samaritan woman well this woman has three strikes against her right from the very beginning first strike is she was a samaritan bad blood between the, the samaritans and and the jews and that's strike number one Second strike was she was a she. <laughs> now that wouldn't go over very well today either. But in, the, in their culture, uh, men kind of avoided talking in, in publicly with, with women as much as they could. Uh, I, I, don't, I don't want to get into the reasons why. In fact, I'm not even sure I know all the reasons why. Part of it is perhaps it didn't want. You know, it didn't look right for a man talking to, to a woman, not his wife, or uh, similar to things that are that are, go on in the Arab world today. And but bottom line is, in that in that culture, men didn't talk to women that much, and unless they knew them really well. So there's strike two, two. About this. Strike three was this was an immoral woman. She was living with a man, not her husband. As we're going to see, she she had had five husbands. Now that just because you had five husbands doesn't necessarily make you immoral. But in this case, she was living with a guy that wasn't her husband. That's strike three. And yet, Jesus treated her with dignity. He approached her and uh, treated her in this whole conversation that we're going to be seeing. He treated her with dignity. So uh, that in itself was something a bit unusual uh, for that time. And the story goes on, it says, Jesus answered and said to her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that says to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. And so she says, what are, what's, what's a man, what's a Jewish man doing asking, uh, talking, asking a drink of a, of a Samaritan woman? And he says, he says to her, if you knew who was talking to you, you would be asking me for water and not just water, but living water. Now, what do you think is going on in her mind when he says, I would have given you living water? Just like Nicodemus, she was a person living in this world. Her mind wasn't up there on spiritual things. Just like Nicodemus, she was thinking of an artesian well. And an artesian well is 
you know, you have a regular well and you have artesian wells. A regular well just dips into the aquifer and the, and the water is uh, staying still there at the bottom of the well. Artesian well, there's a, a stream running underneath the ground and there's a stream running through. Uh, it's like a spring and it provides fresh water continuously to that well. And obviously an artesian well is better than a, a regular kind of well. And she knew that she was drinking from a regular kind of well. Jacob's well had been there for many years. It was not an artesian well. In fact, if, if, the, if the archaeologists have, have identified the correct well, uh, it's still there now, but it's about 100 feet deep. And so uh, anyway, it's, it's, not a, it's not a spring. It's not an artesian well, but this is Jacob's well that she's getting water from. And then he comes and says, I would give you living water. Well, he's not talking about an artesian well. He's not even talking about real water. He's talking about something else, as we'll see as we go along. Verse 11 says, the woman said to him, sir, you have nothing to draw with. And, how, and the well is deep. Where then did you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? Who gave us the well and drank from, drank from it himself, as well as his sons and his livestock. And so he said, "You're you're saying." She says, "You're saying you're going to give me some living water. Are you greater than Jacob?" You know, obviously, Jacob was one of the big guys in, in their their history. Not only the Samaritans, but in the in the, the Jewish world also, Jacob was one of the forefathers of Abraham, then Isaac, and then Jacob in the list of the genealogy. And Jacob gave us this well. Are you, are you better than he is? Did you give us something that, that he can't, uh, that he didn't give us already? And so she makes this comparison with what he's offering to give and what Jacob has already given and, and saying, are you better than that? Well, Jesus' answer to that is, Whoever drinks of this water will thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst. But the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up to everlasting life. Now this water that he's talking about is the water from Jacob's well. You drink from this water, you're going to thirst again. The water that I have to give, you'll, you'll never thirst again. It'll be a fountain of water springing up to life. And so he's talking about, as we know, he's talking about spiritual things. She has it in her head that he's talking about physical things and she doesn't understand. But Jesus answered and said to her, whoever drinks of this water will thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst, but the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. This is spiritual water that he's talking about, spiritual life, but she is not getting it. What she says is, the woman said to him, sir, give me this water that I may not thirst or come here to draw. I don't want to have to come back here every day or more than once a day even to get water for myself, my family, uh, and the animals that I have. Where is this water you're talking about that I, I don't, I'll never have to thirst again? And so she's still thinking physical like Nicodemus. Remember Nicodemus a few lessons back, how, uh, how she didn't, he didn't understand about being born again and going back to his mother's womb, and he was all confused about that. Well, she's not confused about this living water. It's time to wake her up. So Jesus, instead of just throwing a rock at her or shaking her or something, he decides to ask her a question. It'll get her thinking in the, in the right direction. Notice how, how smart he is and how intelligent and how he tries to read a situation now, he had an advantage, as we'll see as we go on. But he asked her this question. Or he says to her, go call your husband and come here. And so he tells her this. 
That seems like an odd thing, doesn't it? Here she asks him this question, and then he says, go get your husband. Well, she says, the woman answered and said, I have no husband. Well, Jesus said to her, you have well said, I have no husband, for you have had five husbands, and the one whom you now have is not your husband. In that, you spoke truly. And so all of a sudden, he's, he's talking to her, and he is telling her details about her life. He knows things about her and things that he shouldn't have known because he had never even met her. I mean, she knows that. She, she's thinking, oh, wait a minute. What's going on here? That would be very unsettling, wouldn't it? If you were talking to somebody and they started telling you details about your life that only you know, details that uh, and we're going to see later on, she testifies that, uh, that to, to her friends up in Sychar, that he's told me everything that ever happened. So that, that John is just uh, cutting it down to this, these few details here, but he was, he was telling her everything she's done. And so you'd be unsettled too, just like you see on TV, people go into a, to a medium or one of these tarot card readers or whatever. And, and as we know, they all say, oh, I see a man in your life. Oh, I bet it's my grandpa. Yeah, that's it. It's your grandpa and me. You know, and, and they just lead him right through. And people are thinking, whoa, how do they know this stuff about me? That's not what happened here. What happened here was Jesus just was telling her stuff. Didn't have to draw out, out those things about her because he knew. And so what's in her mind is she's thinking, how could he know these things? And so now her, her mind is transitioning. He's, she's thinking, ah, I don't, how could he know this stuff? Well, the woman then said to him, sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. You got to be from God. That's what a prophet is, a spokesman for God, somebody that, that comes from God. And she's just like Nicodemus. Nicodemus says, we know, Jesus, we know you're, you're a man of God. Actually, he said, Rabbi, we know you're a man of God. You can't do all this stuff if you, if you weren't. And now she's saying, you're, you got to be a prophet. You couldn't know all this stuff about me if you weren't from God. And so a similar thing happens with her as has happened with Nicodemus. The things that he was doing, and in this case, the things that he was saying was showed that this, this guy is not from around here. This guy is from God. And so uh, Jesus had said earlier, if you knew who it was that says to you, give me a drink, I would have given you living water. And so now all of a sudden, she's starting to understand who this is that asked her this question. And so she's starting to get it. Oh, I'm starting to make a connection here. And so the story continues. She said, our fathers worshiped on this mountain. She just asked him a question worthy of a prophet. Our fathers were worshiped on this mountain. And you Jews say that Jerusalem is the place where we ought to worship. So what's the deal with that? Who's right? Are my fathers, my forefathers, the Samaritans, or are you Jews? Which is right? Jesus said to her, woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. Now, Jesus, all throughout the, the New Testament, probably in the Old Testament too, there's a thing, that technically it's called ellipsis, where you leave out stuff, something. Well, when he says the hour is coming when you will neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem worship the Father, he's not saying that nobody's going to be worshiping in Jerusalem anymore, or nobody's going to be worshiping on Mount Gerizim anymore. But what it, what it means is you're not going to be worshiping only in Jerusalem or only on Mount Gerizim it's, it's going to be widespread, is what he's saying. He says to her, you, 
you Samaritans worship what you do not know. We know what we worship for salvation is of the Jews. Now, this is where I wanted to talk about the Samaritan Pentateuch, one of the differences between the Jews and the Samaritans. Uh, this morning's class, Brandon brought up the Samaritan Pentateuch and our timing was off by a week because he was just getting ready to talk about it and had to end the class. And so uh, next week, you'll, you'll learn more details about it. But one of the things that distinguished the Samaritans from the Jews is the Samaritans didn't accept any of the books after the first five books of the Bible. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. That was, the only, that was their only scripture, the Samaritans. And so they had, that's what a Pentateuch means. Pentateuch is five, and I don't know what tuch means, but anyway, uh, I'm guessing it's books. But anyway, so they had the Samaritan Pentateuch, but they cared for it, and they, and they kept it. That's, that's why it makes the Samaritan Pentateuch be a, a, a very valuable testimony to, to the Bible and, and what it is, <clears throat> at least to the first five books of the Bible. And so uh, what they knew about worship and, uh, and about God things, all they knew was from the Pentateuch. But do you think they're after the Pentateuch, you know, including the Psalms and the Proverbs and all the, all the prophets and you think you'll learn anything about salvation in all those books? Jesus says, you don't even know what you're, you're talking about. We know. Part of the reason why they knew was because they had the whole, the whole Old Testament, not just part of it. And so many prophetic scriptures about, uh, about God and, and uh, so many psalms about worshiping God and, and that sort of thing. And so he's, he's saying salvation is of the Jews. Well, even she, if she had thought about it for very long, would have known that the Messiah was going to come from the Jews, uh, even from the Pentateuch. So he's not telling her anything. He doesn't know as far as where salvation has come from. Salvation comes from the Jews. You guys need to pay attention to, to what we understand uh, a little bit more than you're doing would be an implication from that but then he says the hour is coming which he's already just said the hour is coming then he adds a phrase and now is it's not just coming it's here the hour is coming when the true worshipers will worship the father in spirit and in truth it doesn't matter where you're worshiping but true worship what matters is that it is in spirit and in truth, for the Father is seeking such to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. Now, it doesn't say God is a spirit. So, like, God's a, uh, you know, we think of a ghost or, a, you know, some kind of a spirit moving, moving around. He simply says God is spirit. He lives in a different realm than we physical folks here. He is spirit. And if we want to worship him truly, we also have to be in spirit as well. Now, I just read this morning, uh, Pat, you'll be happy that I read my bulletin this morning. Um, <laughs> but she put in uh, an analogy, page five of the bulletin. And uh, he, he talked, uh, in this analogy, it talks about uh, that God is made, let, well, she, it quotes, let us make man in our image and in our likeness. We're created to be like God. Well, in what way are we created? There's a lot of different ways, but one of the ways is uh, the spiritual thing. And uh, she, she says in here, I'm not going to read it all. Uh, I'll let you, let you read it, but is likewise, when a man is disconnected from God, he dies. We need to be connected with God. God is a spirit, and the way we connect with him is spiritually. This is not outward worship like we're doing in Mount Gerizim, like we're doing in, in uh, the temple in Jerusalem, or sacrificing animals and all this outward stuff. He says, the hour is coming, in fact, it's here, when true worshipers don't just do outward stuff, but we worship in spirit and in truth. 
And this also says, uh, God is our natural environment. That's, that's kind of a, a neat phrase there. God is where we live. I mean, that, that should be our environment when we have a relationship with him. And then uh, the last part of it says, it's only in him that life exists. And that's very true. Uh, Jesus is talking here about, I'll give you living water, the water of life. That's where real life exists. And we're talking spiritual things. Now, when he says in spirit and in truth, they must worship in spirit and truth. Is that different? Is that something different than, than they had already? Kind of. No. Were, were they supposed to be spiritual? What was, what was the verse that I read? Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, and mind. Are those... Are those the physical, physical attributes? No, it's the spiritual side. God says, I want all of you. I want, I want your, your spirit, your soul. You must love me even at soul level. And, and were they supposed to worship by truth in the Old Testament? Of course they were. That's what all those laws were about. So they were supposed to always be worshiping in spirit and in, in truth. What this, what this structure here that Jesus talked about, spirit and the truth, really what it means is truly spiritual. We need to worship on a spiritual level. God is spirit, and we must worship in spirit. And that's what he's talking about as he talks about they not just should or ought to or might be a good idea. They that worship him must worship in a truly spiritual way. Worship in spirit and in truth. So then the woman said to him, I know that the Messiah is coming. And John adds, who is called Christ. Messiah, that's what the word Messiah in, in Hebrew means in, in Greek. Jesus, all, all she says, I know Messiah is coming. And when he comes, he will tell us all things. He'll, he'll give us all the answers. Don't worry. Uh, I'm asking you these questions, and you're telling me this stuff. And so she goes, I know Messiah is coming, and uh, he'll tell us everything. Well, Jesus then said to her, uh, I who speak to you am he. Can you imagine talking to somebody, talking to a guy? And he's telling you stuff, and, and you say, well, you know, and, well, for example, I mean, this is just a really poor, poor excuse or for an example, but I used to deliver bottled water, and, and one day I got a, a, a call to go set up bottled water for uh, this woman who I didn't know, uh, and, uh, or I forget what her first name was, but her last name was Marvin, and I went there, and when I, when the guy came to the door, I started bringing the water and the, the dispenser in there, and I thought, man, this guy looks a lot like Lee Marvin, and, and so as we were going through, I said, are you related to Lee Marvin? And he goes, I am Lee Marvin, <laughs> and I thought, wow. <laughs> you know, you young folks might not know who Lee Marvin is, but he won Best Actor for a, a role in Catalou. Uh, you know, famous Big Red One. He was in a lot of a lot of movies and stuff. And so, him being about the only celebrity that I've ever run across or ever met, uh, it means something to me. But can you imagine? You know, you multiply that by a hundred billion, and that's about what you would get to have this man she's talking to say. She says, I know the Messiah is coming. He says, I am the Messiah. You just imagine what that, what that would be. He says, I am he. What words are that? Uh, just it gives me shivers just, to, just thinking about what it must have been like for her. Uh, but there's another way to translate this phrase. As I was reading through uh, the Greek text, 
um, it just hit me like a brick because it uses the exact phrase where it says, I am. It's another way to look at it is saying, I am is speaking to you. I spent a lot of time talking to you folks about I am when you're talking about God and his, his attributes and everything. He says, and Moses, Moses says, who do I say sent, sent you? And he says, tell him I am sent you. The I am just means eternal. I exist. I am. I am. And that's what Jesus says to her. I am. The one speaking to you is I am. Wow. That, that just blows my mind to think about. She knew from the Pentateuch. That's where Moses said, asked that question. Who do I say sent me? And he says, tell him I am sent you. Here's Jesus saying, I am. The one speaking to you, I am. I don't know how hard that must have, might have hit her, but we're going to see from, from this that uh, it, she ends up going and telling a lot of folks in, in Sychar. But I want to ask this first. Is this why he needed to go to Samaria? Is this why he was compelled, compelled to go to Samaria so he could begin announcing that he is the Messiah? I think so. He definitely... Uh, wanted to get that message out and it was very important to get that message out and who of all people would be the least likely to be a problem for the, for the Pharisees. They're, odds are they're not going to hear about this, this incident where they might hear about it if he was in Jerusalem. But he says to her, and, and he uses a, an ingenious way of, of getting around to it, announcing to her, I am the one you've all been looking for. I am Messiah. What a thrill that had to be for her. It's thrilling for me just to think about it. Well, the story is going to have to continue next week because we're out of time. And next, next week, we're going to see that she goes into the city, tells everybody, man, I think, we, I think it might be the Messiah that I found out there. And he, he's told me everything I've ever done. And then Jesus goes into the city, spends two days there. We're going to talk about that next week. But as far as bringing the lesson home to us for today, what we've talked about today, I want to ask us the question, do we know who it is who's speaking to us? Jesus said, if, if you had known to this woman, if you'd known who's speaking to you, you'd have been coming to me for living water. Do we know who it is that speaks to us as we read through our Bible? As we read these accounts. That's God speaking to us. That's Jesus speaking to us. His words. Do you think about that? Who it is that's talking to us when we read our Bible? I think it would make our Bible reading a lot more exciting, a lot more impactful and powerful if we would think about that. Just have that in the back of our mind all the time when we read. This is the I am. This is the great I am that's speaking to us, speaking to me when I, as I read these things. This is the creator of the heavens and the earth, the eternal one, speaking to me. Next point. Well, part of this point. Do you know, if you don't know who he is, whether you know him or not, he knows you. Just like he knew this woman, knew, knew her whole history. He knows you. Do you know him? That's the question that I wanted to leave you with. Also, Jesus is the one that offers this life, this living water. And keep that in mind. The only way you're going to get living water that you can drink and not have to thirst again, thirsting spiritually, that's through Jesus. A fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. That is Jesus in our lives. Next point. Your worship must be truly spiritual. You don't have an option. If your life, if your worship is not truly spiritual, you're not one of those 
the ones whose God is seeking. He wants us to all be truly spiritual in our worship. And so I want to leave us with this. Think about it through the week. Think about how we can get our life, our, our, our worship to be more spiritual, more truly spiritual. The time is not a week from now or next next year. The time is now. Work on getting your life, your your worship spiritual before God. And also, when you hear or read Jesus' words, I am speaking to you. Listen to Jesus as, as you read through the Gospels. That is the great I am speaking to you. All of this stuff is worth meditating on. So I'm hoping that during the week, each one of us will take some time out to just sit and think about who it is that speaks to us when we read our Bibles and what it means to us to have the great I am speaking to us. And so let's think about that as we uh, go throughout the week. If you're here today and, and you uh, are not right with God, you're not in spirit with him, you can make it right. If you don't know what to do, ask somebody. They can, they can help you. If you're not right with God, you haven't been close, you haven't been worshiping in spirit, you need to make that right. Determine now in your heart. To, to, I want to get my life spiritual, and I want to do what I need to do, whatever it takes. We'll, we'll be glad to help you in, in any way we can. We just encourage you to think about it, and if you need to come forward and, and uh, request uh, help from us, do so while we stand and sing the invitation.